I don't think I could really say what my all-time favourite Lee Miller picture is because it is just such an incredibly diverse body of work and I think that that is my favourite thing. My name's Amber Butchart, I'm a fashion historian and author and broadcaster. Ranging from these very sort of avant-garde images in, in the 20s and 30s right through to her war reportage which is just mind-blowing that you know the fact that she was at the liberation of concentration camps and reporting from there she was she managed to get images published in vogue in in a fashion magazine that otherwise would just not have been featured she really pushed boundaries in terms of you know female war correspondence and the fact that you're seeing this you know in a magazine like vogue is is just absolutely astounding Hello and welcome to our Lee Miller Fashion in Wartime Britain podcast series. I'm Amy Buhessen and the famous photographer Lee Miller was my grandmother and I also am the co-director of her archives. In this series, we are looking at one of the subjects that cemented Lee's reputations as a great photographer, wartime fashion. Strangely, this aspect of her work today is overlooked and somehow forgotten. Most people know her more for the work that she did in the last 18 months of the war, when she was a war correspondent reporting from the front in Europe. However, before that, for four and a half years, Lee was in Britain, carrying the weight of British Vogue's fashion photography. In this episode, I'm talking to Amber, about the pushes and pulls of fashion during the war in Britain, and we'll find out what effects it had on the future of fashion for the country. I started out by asking her how she came across Lee Miller's work. Yes, there were a couple of things that initially sparked my interest in Lee Miller and her work. Firstly, when I did my master's degree at London College of Fashion, my tutor, Becky Conakin, had been researching Lee Miller so I was quite aware of her work from that. I also really remember going to an exhibition at the v The Art of Lee Miller in 2007. It was just such a fantastic overview of her incredible life and career and I especially remember the way it finished with some images from her working guests piece, the last piece that she wrote and photographed for Vogue, where she just had all of her friends, these, you know, people like Henry Moore, coming over and sort of doing odd jobs around Farley Farm. And I just thought it just was such a fantastic idea. And the idea that that was in Vogue just seemed incredibly sort of avant-garde, I guess, in many ways. When Lee joined the magazine, it was a very interesting time, with the Second World War demanding new things of fashion. British fashion was really fundamentally changed by the Second World War. So many aspects of life on the home front were really altered, and these alterations could have long-lasting effects as well. So in terms of fashion, crucially, rationing was brought into effect on June 1st, 1941, it had been kept really secret because the government were concerned about people panic buying. You know, we have very uh, sort of contemporary experience of this kind of panic buying now, having lived through the pandemic. And they were very keen to prevent this. The president of the Board of Trade, Oliver Littleton, actually sort of announced it to the nation. He said, we must learn as civilians to be seen in clothes that are not so smart because we are bearing yet another share in the war. So immediately there was this message that we must wear old clothes and not be ashamed of it. So directly linking people's shopping habits, people's dressing habits with the war effort. Now clothes rationing saw the implementation of state-controlled production as a way of ensuring fairer distribution. And it didn't just last through the years of war, it actually lasted through until 1949. So this saw coupons being issued, which could limit the amount of new clothing that people could buy. Now, as well as the coupons, new clothing that was produced also had to conform to austerity regulations. Now, this was a really important way of conserving materials and conserving labour for the war effort. So this meant that, for example, 
the types of fastenings you could use, you know, zippers, zips weren't used as much because the metal was very important for munitions, for the war effort. So it fundamentally affected design. Luckily, these restrictions didn't extend to the colour that was used in clothes. We tend today to think of austerity rules as being really drab, but that's really not the case at all. We do see some pieces in museum collections like the Imperial War Museum, for example. They show clothing in really deep hues, like a gorgeous mustard coat, purple dress, and also lots of really cheerful, bright, multicolour prints as well. There's a fantastic house coat in the collections of the Imperial War Museum that has a print of red and green mushrooms. It's, it's actually kind of bordering on psychedelic, and it's just fantastic. Similarly, following the spirit of camaraderie and patriotism, I love the way British designers really rose to the challenges that rationing presented. Fashion and function could be really, really happy bedfellows. And we see this in some of the items in the collections at the Imperial War Museum. For example, there's a patent leather handbag, which looks like a really gorgeous handbag. It has these kind of curved surfaces. It was actually created to house a gas mask. They also have an incredible siren suit as well. They were these kind of all-in-one, very practical items. The idea was that if there was an air raid, you could slip this on potentially over what you were wearing, especially if you were wearing, you know, pyjamas if it was the middle of the night. I am a huge fan of siren suits, actually, just for day-to-day -day wear. They look fantastic. They're a really great piece of functional clothing. So that's the kind of precursor to, to today's onesies, right? It really is. I mean, it definitely it was a onesie. It's very, very practical item, comfortable item. You can even see images of Churchill wearing siren suits. He apparently called them romper suits, um, which is, you know, a name that we still have today as well. His were often made by the German street shirt maker Turnbull and Asser. And he even had a green velvet one. It just really shows how chic these wartime fashions could be. So rationing alone wasn't really enough to guarantee that there was a reasonable standard of clothing available to everybody. And so to help with that, the Utility Apparel Order was brought into force in February 1942. And this actually lasted for a decade, so lasted into the 1950s. So what this utility apparel order essentially created was a range of clothing that became known as utility clothes. And this was clothing that was made to these specific restrictions. It followed the austerity regulations in terms of the design, and it was made from a limited range of quality controlled fabrics. So this was civilian clothing. This isn't, uh, you know, uniform. This isn't military clothing. It's for civilians. This created efficiency in factories. And crucially, it ensured that there was a solid caliber of price-regulated clothing that was being produced. So this was an attempt to really prevent a sort of huge disparity. And by the end of the war, utility items made up 85% of all clothing sold. So Audrey Withers, the editor of Vogue at this time, was always incredibly supportive of these directives. She immediately got behind rationing, she immediately got behind utility clothing. There was another huge change to clothes that fashion and how it was covered in magazines had to take account of too. It's estimated that over 15 million people, basically a third of the population, wore some kind of uniform during the war. And we see, you know, Lee Miller and the features editor at Vogue, Leslie Blanche, often visited women on duty to really report on their essential work. Um, it's interesting that we even saw echoes of that in July 2020 when British Vogue put key workers on their covers for that July issue. Train driver, a midwife and a supermarket assistant. This kind of shifting social meaning of clothing was really encapsulated by the editor of Women's Wear News. She said, if I went into a restaurant in an evening gown and sat next to a woman in a service uniform, I should feel most embarrassed. That really, I think, gives a strong sense of the way that people were dressing, how fundamentally it was being altered at this point. 
Like in some ways you could argue that uniform is a relatively easy idea to sell in terms of making it glamorous. Workwear in many ways is a more difficult notion to sell. But it was certainly a challenge that Audrey Withers and Lee Miller took to with vigour. In accordance with the Ministry of Information, Lee Miller's pictures had actually played a role in encouraging women to wear their hair short when they were working in factories to avoid injuries. And then we see it really clearly coming through in an article, again illustrated by Lee's pictures, uh, an article called Fashions for Factories. This featured in the June 1941 issue of British Vogue. And the pictures that we see here are just absolutely incredible. Fitted boiler suits that would just not look out of place in a fashion magazine today. And the accompanying text also makes a clear argument in favour of this necessarily practical style. It says, these factory fashions have a tough chic of their own, derived from the fact that they are functional. So they even say, like, goggles smart as sunglasses are worn where sparks fly. So it really redefines ideas about glamour and style for the British public. The push to support the government in their efforts to reorientate the nation's fashion tastes not only came from publications like British Vogue, but from the nation's top designers. The same year that the utility scheme launched, in 1942, the top British couturiers also grouped together and they formed the Incorporated Society of London Fashion Designers. This was subsequently shortened to Inksoc. So this is really the top designers of the day, people including Norman Hartnell, Digby Morton, Victor Stiebel, Bianca Mosca... Hardy Amys, later joined by others like Charles Creed and Edward Molinex as well. Now, the aim here was really to promote British fashion overseas, because while clothing at home was regulated and was restricted, you could still potentially tap into very lucrative markets abroad. And this could really help with the war effort at home. Even before Inksoc was formed, the designers actually played a key role in promoting British sales abroad. And we can see that in an article from American Vogue uh, from September 1940. And this article was illustrated with images by Lee Miller. And it really explained to American readers which department stores were importing clothes from British couturiers. It actually said buying a new British suit is as much a contribution to British defence as a sum of money. A new sweater puts another nail in a plane for Britain. So these exports were absolutely crucial, and it could help with both the reputation of British design and the wartime economy as well. So these Inksoc designers were recruited by the Board of Trade to create designs anonymously for the utility scheme. And so this was really an attempt to you know, get get women essentially on board with the utility scheme to really sort of glam up what could be seen as particularly austere designs. So these resulting designs proved to be a really fantastic marketing tool for the utility scheme. It added a touch of glamour to the austerity rules and it allowed a much greater proportion of the population access to designer clothing for the first time. So when we think today about these collaborations that we often see between fast fashion brands and, you know, big name designers, we can see the roots of that right back in this Inksoc utility design scheme. Some prototypes were given to the Victoria and Albert Museum by the Board of Trade, and two items can actually even be identified with specific designers. Uh, So, for example, there is a fantastic uh, grey herringbone wool skirt suit featuring a red bow at the neck. And this is actually identifiable as a Digby Morton design for utility. Now, it's very classically what we think of as 1940s wartime sort of utility design. There's a nipped in waist, knee length skirt. Now, crucially, the outfit really conforms to... Uh, what Vogue wrote about these ink sock austerity pieces. They talked about them as an object lesson in the power of pure style over mere elegance. Now, what's particularly interesting, I think, about this ensemble 
is that it didn't try to hide its association with the utility scheme at all. It wasn't sort of dressed up as something else because the suit has metal buttons and these buttons feature a stylized version of the CC41 mark. Now this mark was designed by Reginald Ship and it featured on all utility products. So it was in the label of clothes, it was even on utility furniture which was produced. So is, isn't there a red wool blouse by Bianca Mossa in the V&A as well that's part of it? Yes, there certainly is. Um, and it is identified as a piece by Bianca Mosca at, at Jack Ma. Um, she designed for Jack Ma and Pakhan in London during the war. And this blouse is just an absolutely beautiful piece. It really demonstrates how fashionable utility designs could be. It's fitted, it's got this lovely ruffled collar, it's got matching buttons, and it's got this gorgeous all-over print of these beige and pale blue daisies. It is an incredibly pretty item. It's like I would 100% wear it today. It's lovely. I love it. Jack Ma themselves, the company she was working for, are quite an interesting company. They started out as a textile house in Mayfair in 1932 by a couple, Jack and Mary Lyons. They actually combined their names of Jack and Mary to create this kind of suitably French-sounding company, Jack Ma. Now, their print designer uh, was a man called Arnold Lever, and he continued his design work for them even after he joined the RAF. Now, they became known for their really expressive propaganda prints. They featured this real kind of range of rallying cries on scarves and on garments. Really quite incredible pieces. In terms of social history, they're just fantastic. Some of these propaganda prints were even featured in Vogue. They did a big double-page spread in April 1942. The article was actually called Propaganda Prints, and they wrote, scribbled slogans, narrative pictures are a print trend. So Arnold Lever of Jack Maher employs the slogans and stories of wartime England. Bianca Mosca designed the clothes these leading ladies wear. All is done with propaganda purpose and an eye on export. Now, this is just a fantastic article because one of the women featured was even Vivian Lee, and she is featured wearing this blouse and hair ornament in a print called 66 Coupons. Now, this print in its design referenced rationing, and the name of it, 66 Coupons, even refers to the amount of coupons people were given when clothing rationing first came in. It also featured the tennis champion Simone Mathieu, and she wore a print that was called Free France, and this even featured General de Gaulle's signature. This incorporation of the French cause into British style is really interesting. France was incredibly important to Lee. She cited it for the main reason of staying in Britain at the start of the war, when other Americans like her were having letters from the embassy asking her to return home. Her love was of Paris, where she had started her career as a photographer in the late 1920s. She felt she needed to stay and do what she could as part of the war effort. But with America not in the war, she couldn't fight or join the services, so her camera became her weapon of choice. Lee was in France as it was liberated from Nazi control and she shot a number of stories for Vogue looking at French fashion there. The British press and public were really quite shocked by the images that they saw coming out of newly liberated Paris. The styles that, that, that Miller had photographed were just so completely different to what had become the norm in Britain. And she wrote um, an article to accompany her pictures and she said, everywhere in the streets were attractive girls. Their silhouettes, full skirts, tiny waists were very queer and fascinating to me after the utility and austerity of England. So she was drawing this comparison herself, clearly incredibly, you know, cognizant of this fact that these um, styles she was seeing would just not be allowed at all in wartime Britain. Now, she described these full skirts as defiant. She said if three metres of material were specified for a dress, the French found 15 for a skirt alone. Saving material and labour meant help to the Germans. It was patriotic to waste instead of save. 
So she really puts forth this argument that it was a particular act of resistance on the part of the French women. So this coverage of occupation style really renewed interest in the idea that had been circulating in Britain and in America as well, that they were potentially quite keen to take the mantle of global fashion leader away from Paris. There were even plans drawn up, like when the plans for the Allied landings in Normandy were being made in early 1944, the Board of Trade and the Minister of Reconstruction actually discussed the possibility of Britain taking the mantle of global fashion leader from Paris to help with the post-war economic recovery. And you start seeing this idea being floated in the press as well. So, for example, in November 1944, so just a few months after the liberation of Paris, when the war is still raging, the Daily Mirror published an article titled Britain is now fashion boss, not Paris. And the piece resolutely declared French influences will be ignored and fashions will be Anglo-American. As history tells us, this was wishful thinking as French fashion prevailed. But... The British didn't go down without a fight and expanded the roster of designers in Insoc and turned to new ways of advertising their clothes. Following the end of clothes rationing in 1949, the couturiers provided costumes for a film called Maytime in Mayfair. This was actually set in a London fashion house. And the film features a fashion show sequence, which had become a really popular motif in Hollywood films in the 1930s, and showcased the elegant responses of British designers to this new Parisian mode. So what happened with the InSoc designers after the war? Well, Bianca Mosca, who had been very successful designing for other people during the Second World War, actually opened her own house in her own name in 1946. Hardy Amys had been designing for the company La Chasse before the war, um, and he opened his own company his, in his own name in 1946 as well, on Savile Row. He had had an incredibly interesting wartime experience. He worked for the Intelligence Corps, and he also joined the Special Operations Executive in 1941. This was an underground division set up to work with resistance forces in enemy-occupied territories. So really incredibly important work he was doing during the Second World War. He eventually even became the head of the Belgian section. So he came back, um, 1946, started up his own company in his own name and went on to have an incredibly long and distinguished career. He was given a knighthood eventually for this in 1989 because in the 1950s he became one of the key dress designers to Queen Elizabeth II. As well as helping to make some of the names in British fashion, the war had a much longer lasting effect on the country's tastes and style. The, the notion of utility clothing, of this, you know, good quality mass produced clothing sort of increased the standard of clothing that people came to expect and it increased the, the standard of clothing that was available, essentially. Also, things like the ink sock couturiers, you know, getting involved with the utility scheme, this notion of designer fashion potentially being within the reach of more people had a sort of democratizing effect. So in many ways, it sort of laid the groundwork for what we see happening later in the 1960s, where we have the sort of youth quake and the real sort of dominance of London fashion on a global stage. And this whole notion of it being much more democratized, of it being about street style, about, um, you know, youth culture, the sort of groundwork for that can, you know, arguably be said to have been laid during the Second World War. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Lee Miller, Fashion in Wartime Britain. The book of the same name is available from all good bookshops and from the Lee Miller archives and Farley's House and Gallery website. Next episode, I'm speaking with Robin Muir, contributing editor to British Vogue, and he talks about Lee's contribution to British Vogue's fashion pages during the war. Thank you so much to Amber Butchart for this episode. Before she left, I managed to ask her what her favourite standout image from the book was. Music.
actually really genuinely love the Fashions for Factories feature. The boiler suit that's worn, it tapers at the ankles, it's fitted at the waist, it has these very slightly puffed shoulders, is basically incredibly glamorous functional workwear. And that is just one of my favorite things to wear. Like I love dressing in workwear and then just dressing it up with a turban, you know, or a necklace or something like that to make it look really functional, but really glamorous. That whole notion of functional glamour is actually something I'm really obsessed with. So those pictures in particular, I just love. And especially when they are coupled with the kind of turban headwear that we see in some of those pictures as well. I just absolutely love them. This episode was presented by me, Amy Buhasen, and our guest today was Amber Butchart and is produced by Tolly Robinson. The soundtrack was courtesy to Wolf Music and the episode is copyright the Lee Miller Archives England 2021. This series is made possible with DCMS Culture Recovery funding which was awarded to us by the Arts Council England. <laughs>